Mr. Chairman, just to preface this this presentation, Oahe is is one of those other waters or parts of the state where there's a lot of um, of attention to it and. Uh, like with streams in the Black Hills, when you get into your reservoirs, they can change very quickly for the fishery. They're very dynamic, and, uh, and Mark and his crew have, have done a nice job of tracking that. And uh, this morning, we'd like to share the information with you to update you on the status of the reservoir. Great. Hey, Mark. Good morning. Good morning, Chair. Yep. So like John said, I'll talk about Lake Hawaii. Um, I'll try to be somewhat brief. I'm just going to go through the results. Um, 2014, the surveys, the trail survey, and the really if there's any questions thank you sir uh, I'd be happy to field any questions and too uh, I do have a couple slides on Lake Sharp um, um, we'll get to that I mean uh, Lake Sharks Lake Sharp is kind of the rock and doesn't change that much but I do have a couple slides just to show what harvest and the population looks like on Lake Sharp so a brief outline for uh, the Lake Hawaii talk um, really get into the prey fish and our two different surveys the the open water survey and then the near shore near shore survey um, go into walleye uh, the current walleye trends with our gillnet survey our, our yearly population survey um, mainly talk about condition and abundance you know the two main factors with our walleye is you know what do they look like what's their condition and how many are out there and then talk about our, our creel and um, our creel survey and how many people are fishing uh, in 2014 and what was the catch and harvest like so starting off, you know, our, our biggest question we always get, um, you know, weekly, daily is, uh, you know, the smelt, how many smelt we have out there. And every year, the end of July, we uh, complete our hydroacoustic survey. And this is our survey um, that we use yearly to estimate the number of rainbow smelt that are out in the system. Um, essentially, we use a uh, souped up depth finder to go out and count fish um, in a transect along the lake. And we do multiple transects and we extrapolate that out to the entire lake. To come up with an estimated number of rainbow smelt, um, and then, like I said, we have 20 transects. Uh, we got that done end of July. Two things to note: these are two different figures. Um, you know, years on the x-axis, so since 1998, and then uh, um, the total pelagic prey fish in millions on the y-axis. Again, so that's um, quite a few fish. Uh, the horizontal white lines are going to be the averages, the long-term averages since that time. The top panel is going to be our, our cold water, open water prey fish. So that's the number of prey fish that are below the thermocline out in the open water. I get estimated number. Um, and the bottom panel is going to be our warm slash cool water prey fish. So these are uh, the fish that are above the thermocline out in Lake Oahe. So we'll start at the top. Um, this will be primarily rainbow smelt. Um, the total number of prey fish was right at 42 million. Um, this last year, though, we did have a really good hatch of lake herring, and we know that um, that number does include uh, some lake herring as well. Um, but we're estimating somewhere around 20, uh, a little bit above 20 million uh, rainbow smelt that are out in the system. So um, we did come up from last year, um, which is a, a positive note. Um, we were pretty low last year. You know, it was our um, second lowest estimate of rainbow smelt that we've had in uh, 2014. You know, we did come up from that, you know, almost doubled what we had in 2013, so that's a good thing. Um, but the other thing to note, uh, and, you know, the rest of those fish in the cold water as well as those fish in the warm and cool water, our lake herring production was very good this year. Um, you know, for the warm, cool water, open water prey fish, we're at 167 million fish, um, and that's over our, our long-term average, too. So, um, again, these are going to be primarily lake herring and um, a very uh, a very good year for lake herring reproduction. So that was the open water. Um, then we also do a, a survey for our near shore prey fish, um, and for this we use you know a, a fairly large uh, just a, a bag seine. Um, we pull it near the the shoreline to catch all those little fish, all those little prey fish that are hanging out along the shore. Uh, and for this we use. Um, we do this at nine locations, and we do four net poles at each location. Um, and what this survey does is it takes into account, uh, you know, pretty much all the prey species that are not associated with the open water. They're not a smelt or um, lake herring. So they're the, the different minnow species, um, small yellow perch, um, the, the young of the year, other fish like white bass, 
freshwater drum, um, crappie, uh, bluegill, you know, there's just a whole suite of other fish that are out there. And if you remember last year, 2013, we had the sixth highest abundance of these other types of prey fish out there too. Um, and this last year, we actually broke the record by quite a bit. We were averaging up over a thousand prey fish per seine haul, um, which, you know, you look at the long-term average and it's far and above the, the long-term average. Um, so this year was a, a very good year for lake herring, but then it was also a very good year for um, these other warm water near shore prey fish, um, yellow perch, white bass, um, shiners, various other, you know, there's a lot of crappie out there too, especially up in the Grand, the Moreau and stuff. So, you know, other than rainbow smelt, rainbow smelt are, are making a comeback slowly but surely, but we also have a lot of these other prey fish out there, um, which has been good for our predator fish, sport fish. Now to, you know, kind of look at our walleye trends, we uh, have our annual population assessment and it is conducted in August of every year. Um, to conduct this, we do uh, six different uh, gill nets at nine different locations throughout the lake. Um, the gill nets are 300 foot long, you know, pretty big gill nets, and they're benthic. They sit on the bottom and set them overnight, and then the next morning we check the nets, pull out the fish, age them, and take the sizes and numbers and stuff. Walleye trends, um, you know, it's no surprise that we really peaked in 2011. Uh, then since then, you know, we've been decreasing fairly steadily. Um, after the smelt crash in 2011, we knew that mortality was going to increase quite a bit, and uh, um, particularly for those larger fish, and we ended up seeing that. Um, uh, abundance has dropped to just below our 15-year uh, average. Um, the thing to note, uh, you know, a, a positive note is that our uh, the number of fish between 15 and 20 inches did increase from last year, and I imagine um, it's going to increase this next year as well. Uh, but those, the abundance of fish over 20 inches is um, pretty low. Um, and again, this was kind of expected because we knew that after that smelt crash, the fish that are the hardest hit are going to be our large, you know, our large fish, our fish over 18 inches. And we knew that natural mortality would be very high. And, kind of ended up seeing that. Um, so abundance of fish over 20 inches is, um, they're pretty rare and, you know, it'll take a while to build those back up. But we do have a, a good number of fish under 15 inches and, you know, we're building that uh, group of 15 to 20 inches over the next couple of years. If, you know, prey fish remains the way it is, you know, we should see that increase every year. And this is, you know, the, the slide that, you know, is the uh, the most influential, or I don't want to say most important, but it's a very important aspect, and this is condition. Um, this is condition over the last 15 years. Um, we use a, uh, we use, it's called relative weight, and it's, it's just an, uh, uh, an abundance, or uh, not abundance, uh, a way to measure, you know, the relative plumpness of a fish, so how fat a fish is, essentially. You know, the higher the, the number, the fatter a fish is, is the best way to look at it, and um, if you look like after 2011, you know, we saw that drop, you know, the smelt crash, a lot of hungry fish out there. The relative plumpness, the fatness of the fish really dropped after that, you know, and this is where mortality increased and we had a lot of fish actually starving. Um, 2013 came, you know, we had uh, the sixth highest warm water prey fish abundance. Um, you know, we started seeing an increase from 12 to 13, but really, uh, 2014, we have all that food out there and we've seen condition, particularly of the fish less than 20 inches, has really, really came back. Um, up over 85, which is, you know, kind of a benchmark to have, you know, good looking fish out there. On average, these fish are above that, um, well, at least for the fish less than 20 inches. Um, you know, the fish over 20 inches, you know, they were, obviously they were the hardest felt, you know, they were the skinniest of all the fish out there. Um, they didn't come back like uh, you know we were hoping last year, but this year you know they're starting to conditions improving. I should say you know a couple more years and um, or at least hopefully you know one more year we'll have that back up around 85. Have those fish looking really good, but um, yeah, the fish under 20 inches are, are are looking really good as far as conditions concerned. 
So looking at our, our, our creel survey, um, you know, a lot of people are interested in how many people are actually fishing out on Lake Oahe. Uh, angling pressure this year was almost right on average. I think we were 9,000 angler hours short of average. Um, we were at, right at 771,000 angler hours uh, for 20, 2014, and I think the, the long-term average is 780 or something like that, so we we're right at average. Uh, catch and harvest, our uh, catch has decreased substantially from the last two years. Um, you know, in 2012, 2013, we had a lot of hungry fish out there. Um, our catch rates were very high. It was very easy to catch fish. Um, and with this drop in our, our, our catch down to 930,000, you know, that's actually a very good sign. You know, those fish are getting harder to catch. Um, you know, they're not as hungry, uh, which is a very good thing. And with that, we also saw, you know, a pretty substantial drop in our harvest, too, down to 370,000 walleye harvested um, this last year. And something we always look at, too, uh, it's, a, it's a good indication of what the population in, is doing, is this is the average length of walleye harvested on Lake Oahe. Um, and this actually tracks population very well. When the population is doing good, people keep larger fish. As the population declines for one way or another, people tend to keep smaller fish. And this last year, we actually leveled off in the, the size of fish that are being kept. We averaged 14, just under 15 inches for walleye, um, which is a good thing. If you look, you know, generally when you have these ups and downs in the population, you see the same thing in the creel. Um, and in 2001, we hit the lowest, I should say the shortest fish on average that was ever caught, and then they started rebounding. Um, Hopefully, you know, with this leveling off from 2013 to 2014, it means that we're going to start that ascending limb on, uh, you know, the, the fishing's going to get better. People are going to start keeping larger fish, and, you know, the fishery's on the rebound, essentially. So um, we look at that quite a bit. So like I said, it was a, a pretty quick presentation on Lake Oahe. Uh, the summary, when I say high warm water prey fish abundance, you know, this was the highest we've ever documented. Um, each one of those nets, like I said, on average had a thousand um, prey fish, individual prey fish in each net, which is very, very high. Um, improved cold water prey fish, you know, we saw the smelt uh, increase, but we also saw uh, there's a lot of lake herring out there. And if you talk to a lot of anglers, you know, they'll second that notion. They've seen a lot of open water prey fish out there. And the majority of those are going to be lake herring, but, you know, there's still food out there, that's for sure. Uh, increased growth and condition of walleye, you know, especially those fish under 20 inches, they've really rebounded well. So uh, if we can keep food out there, um, you know, they're going to be some happy walleye. And our abundance, you know, the, the number of fish that we have, um, less than 15 inches and 15 to 20, in, or that should be 15 to 20, but increased abundance of uh, walleye in that 15 to 20 inch um, category this last year too, which is a good thing. You know, the fish are growing. Um, which is always good. That's all I had. Any questions on Lake Hawaii? That's all I had. Oh, I should note that the, the Mobridge ice fishing tournament uh, was this last weekend, believe it or not, and the big fish of the tournament was 12.5, 12, 12 pounds, 5 ounces, which is a, a very nice walleye, and the second biggest was uh, just under 10 pounds. So they're catching big fish, and they're looking nice. Um, they also broke the um, tournament record this year for total weight of fish that a team brought in so you know the fish are, lo are looking good particularly up in that region up in the grand moreau upper parts of lake oahe so looking very good mark you'd uh we, a couple of times when i was stuck visiting with you maybe you can help the commission understand that when we have these uh lower sm smelt numbers we we do better with our inshore prey and, and in, in this particular case also the open water prey. Maybe mm -hmm. is it just real quick? Just let them know what you see on, in regards to that relationship, that dynamic. It is, that's very true. Usually, um, you know, when we have a lot of smelt in the system, we see fewer of you know the lake herring and these other uh, nearshore uh, prey items. And um, there's a couple of reasons, you know, a couple different thoughts on that. And one of the, the the idea that has the most strength is that uh, rainbow smelt are actually 
pretty carnivorous and they will eat larval fish of other species and they'll actually cannibalize on themselves too quite a bit. So when you have very high numbers of rainbow smelt, the thought is, is that they'll actually eat larval fish of say lake herring or some of those other near shore prey. Um, so much so that, you know, we usually never see lake herring production like we have in the last couple of years. Uh, the last time we saw this was after the last prey crash in the, the late 1990s, the last smelt crash, I should say. So, um, you know, when one falls, it seems like another one picks up to kind of uh, carry the weight. And then as the smelt will come back, we'll probably end up seeing fewer and fewer of these lake herring and the other warm water prey fish. Um, you know, they'll start decreasing again in all likelihood. Doug, do you have a comment? Yeah, just a question. Yeah. You know, on, on Lake Oahe, we're going to go into the spring at the max of the conservation pool. Um, we're going to be right on the, you know, right below the threshold, which of course sets for the maximum allowable level. And I think that's true of Sakakalia. In fact, it's a little older right now and, and, and Cat. Uh, mountains so far getting, I think, at least average, maybe above average snowfall from the last seen as far as snowpack. Uh, how does that all bode in your mind looking ahead to 2016? Uh, I mean, from my perspective, there's a good chance the reservoirs are going to be operating at pretty maximum levels this year. Uh, what does that mean in terms of the fishery? Well, up until 2011, I used to say that, you know, fish need water and, you know, a full reservoir is always good because there's a lot of water, there's a lot of cold water habitat, but the problem is, is when you go in at max pool and then you have a spring like we did back in 2011, um, you know, there's a chance or the chance is higher that they're going to open up the filling basin and we'll have another um, major flush. So, you know, that worry is always in the back of my head. And any time that you talk about this kind of stuff, it's hard to forecast what's going to happen because, you know, if we don't get any spring plains runoff and, you know, we don't have those spring rains and stuff. Um, who knows what's going to happen with the water. Um, best case scenario um, as far as fish production is actually if we go into winter, uh, you know, a series a year or two years actually pretty low and get some vegetation growth on the shoreline and then come back two or three years later and actually flood that vegetation. And then when that happens, we get increased nutrients, uh, habitat for uh, spawning structure and stuff. Um, one of the worst things that you can have in a reservoir is an elevation that doesn't change year to year. Um, you don't have that influx of nutrients from flooding that vegetation, flooding that shoreline and whatnot. So, you know, that's also very bad too. But um, as far as predicting, you know, it, 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 I don't like to do it. I would say that because you never know what's going to happen in the spring as far as the weather goes. Um, there still is some vegetation, though, that hasn't been flooded in the years above the max pool level last year yep. and the odds of us getting into that this year at the moment look pretty good. I hope so. <laughs> but then you have the the turn side if we get too much then we're in a another mess. Yeah, I was going to say uh, you know I, it's hard to predict or you know, hope one way or another with water elevations and the amount of discharge. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. When you talked about the the change in the elevation of the water and, and down and then we get vegetation comes back and then go up and that's good. Is there any nutrients in the soil, in the wash that comes down with the change in water levels that gets out of the ground? Is there is there food in that too that helps supplement it? Uh, yeah, and you'll actually see that in tributaries. Anytime there's tributaries bringing in sediments and, you know, they're bringing in... Um, phosphorus, nitrogen, and then, you know, all those elements are mm -hmm. used by the plants, algae and whatnot, and that's how you kind of build this, the, you know, the base of the food system. So, yes, there is, you know, anytime the water's moving, the shorelines are going to be producing some kind of energy, but you really don't see that big spike of nutrients into the water until you have these flooded vegetation. You know, there's always nutrients coming in from, like, the Cheyenne, the Grand, the Moreau. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these are relatively turbid rivers that are coming in, bringing a lot of sediments, again, a lot of nutrients, um, but they're going into a system like o Oahe that's very big. So those nutrients are used fairly quickly, you know, once they enter that system. Um, but there is, yes. There is. But just then the natural wind erosion would always produce some nutrients. You'll get some, yep. Mm -hmm. Okay.
Okay, thank you, Mark. You want me to, any slides on Lake Sharp? Yeah, if you, you, if you got a couple, that'd be I great. Do. Sure. Um, pretty much the same outline for Lake Sharp, uh, prey fish, walleye, and creel um, from 2014 compared to previous years. Uh, prey fish on Lake Sharp, you know, the, the major prey fish is going to be gizzard shad. Um, and 99% uh, of the time, you know, that's uh, the, the major prey fish that's out there is going to be gizzard shad. It really drives uh, Lake Sharp and, you know, Francis Case as well. Um, there's a lot of up and down on this figure. This is just uh, the number per seine hall, <laughs> same as uh, Oahe. Um, over the last few years, there's a lot up and down, but um, when you look at the, the magnitude of the changes, you know, there's, there's not that much change other than 2011, you know, everything above two or 300, you know, is still gonna be a substantial number of fish up there. That's why I said, you know, Lake Sharp is really the rock. It's very consistent as far as, as prey fish. There's only uh, on one occasion has there ever been a, a shortage of prey fish that I, can, that I can think of, and that was in 2011. Uh, as far as abundance, you know, we're seeing the same, uh, the same trend that we're seeing on Lake Oahe, and that's uh, ever since 2011, 2012, you know, it's been dropping um, in abundance. Um, and, you know, we trying to explain this, it, it's pretty tough. Um, you know, after the flood, we've seen a lot of changes in our habitat. You know, the sediments have changed quite a bit, and where fish hang out quite a bit, uh, hang out have changed quite a bit. So I don't know if this is an artifact that the actual abundance in the lake is actually decreasing or that our nets that are in, um, say, Hippo Lake aren't catching fish anymore because the fish aren't using Hippo Lake or um, our nets at Fort Georgia de Grey are not as effective at, that they used to be because Lake Sharp has changed structurally quite a bit more than Lake Oahe has changed. Um, and that's something that, you know, time will only tell. You know, if we see abundance come back, then we'll know that it, wasn't an artifact of our, our sampling being skewed. It was actually that the population is down right now. And, you know, you can see, too, the, the difference in uh, the two different populations. You know, Lake Sharp is generally, a, you know, a factory of producing fish up to 20 inches, but um, we don't see a lot of fish, you know, historically that are over 20 inches. We see, you know, some big fish come out of there, but generally it makes it, it's very good at producing a lot of fish up to 20 inches. And you can see that's just the, uh, the average um, abundance is just above 15 from Lake Sharp, and so we're quite a bit below that. Uh, condition, you know, uh, again, Lake Sharp, I mean, we see, still see it go up and down quite a bit, um, but it's, you know, always, always up around that 82, 83, 84, or above. Uh, condition really doesn't change that much, um, always quality condition. Except 2003, and uh, you know this was before my time, and I don't really remember what occurred that year. But uh, other than that, if you go back, you know conditions always fairly consistent on Lake Sharp. One thing to note too is that uh, if you recall from the Lake Oahe slide on condition, you know our fish less than 20 inches were up over 85. Um, again, that's the the relative weight uh, uh, index of uh, plumpness or whatever. So our our fish less than 20 inches right now on Lake Oahe are actually above the average fish in, in Lake Shark, which is interesting to note. And then creel, you know, our angling pressure um, definitely decreased in 2011. A lot of this was a function that, you know, we couldn't really fish in town where there is a, generally a lot of pressure. We had the boat closures and everything during the flood. So, um, you know, that's kind of take that with a grain of salt. You know, we couldn't be out there at that time. but. You know, angling pressure really doesn't change that much as well. You know, it goes up and goes down, but really not that much. Um, and this last year, we were um, above average as far as angling pressure goes, but nowhere close to the, the peak angling pressure we've seen in past years. And catch and harvest are, um, you know, pretty much the same. Um, I wouldn't say, I think they're both a, a little above average, I would say, for a given year, but, uh, you know, they're not... Um, off the charts high or low, they're just pretty much right around average. We had uh, about 300,000 walleye caught in Lake Sharp this last year and uh, 118,000 actually kept. So, you know, a quick summary, it's, it is pretty much a rock. You know, average uh, production, average condition, abundance is a little low and we're still trying to figure that out, but uh, yeah, everything's still looking good for Lake Sharp.
Any questions? July 1. Then they can keep giving them. All right. Thank you very much, Mark. Thanks. Well done. Appreciate it.